felt that it was it is it is a country that gives a lot, uh, and uh, spiritually, it, it, it was it, it truly phenomenal. I want to thank you all for coming, welcome you here, and really appreciate this collaboration that we had with ATL and putting together today's event. So. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to have a pretty frank dialogue with a group of Jewish, Jewish leaders. And I was surprised in this conversation when we talked about what were our perceptions of each other's community. Um, I was surprised that they viewed the Latina community as being powerful because of our growing numbers, about 50 million in the United States. I understood that better as I learned that Israel is a tiny country, as many of you know, of less of about 8 million people, which is actually smaller than the Chicago metropolitan population, and the Jewish population is about 14 million worldwide. There is a stark contrast in the size of our populations in terms of what that means for our perception of power and, and, and influence. In contrast, during that conversation, Latino leaders commented on the tremendous visibility and influence of the Jewish community. So while small in numbers, the perception of the Latino leaders in that room is that the Jewish community was very powerful, um, despite its relatively small numbers compared to the Latino population. While the Latino community is still challenged to have the political clout commensurate with our numbers. So that exchange really taught me a lot in terms of just beginning, I think, to understand both the diversity, the duality, um, and the similarities of our communities. So that's why we're here today, to really figure out how do we understand our communities better, to learn from each other. So we're pleased that we have this great dialogue for you this afternoon. I'm Please be able to say thank you to our panelists, Representative Lisa Hernandez and Fernando Diaz, managing editor of one newspaper, who I know are going to share a lot of their reflections on their recent trips to Israel. And I'd like to now turn over to Lani Nassiter, the regional director of um, the Anti Defamation League, but not without also saying thank you to David Kirsten and the Latino policy staff that really helped to put this event together for you this afternoon. It's my pleasure be here with you all. Thank you. Everyone hear me? Good. Hi, everybody. I'm Lon Nassiter. Thank you, Sylvia. That was wonderful. Um, I echo her sentiments. I think it is important for our communities to come together. And what better way than to bring two participants who recently went to Israel to talk a little bit about their experience and open up to uh, what they saw, what they thought beforehand, what they realize now, and what the future looks like. So. Um, I want to say thank you also to the Latino Policy Forum. This has been our first real collaboration, and it's been nothing but successful, evidenced by this full path room. And I want to thank my colleague David and Sarah and all the staff at the Latino Policy Forum for putting this together. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight. There was a lot of work to make this happen, so thank you. Um, so let's get to it. I will be the moderator today. I feel like Charlie grows a little bit. I do watch him often, and I feel like I'm Charlie today, so I'll try to get my, my accent down. Um, so in November, we took, ADL took two trips to Israel uh, with Latino leaders. The first one was with um, journalists, Latin American journalists from both Latin America and from the United States. And then two weeks later, we took a group of elected officials to Israel from all over the country as well. On the journalist mission, we had representatives from Atlanta, Boston, Chicago, Dallas, Houston, Miami, Los Angeles, Bolivia, Chile, and Venezuela. And for the legislator mission, we had Connecticut, Houston, Illinois, New York, New Mexico, Chile, and Uruguay. So it was really just a fascinating group of people, leaders from different locations, but equally impressive. Throughout the trip, they met with several different leaders from the Arab Israel community, the Palestinian community, the Jewish community. They met with elected officials. They met with journalists. They went to Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Museum in Israel. They went to Christian holy sites. They went to Jewish holy sites. They really, in a week's period, and, and this is funny because we all say this, those of you who have gone on any ADL mission realize that ADL doesn't stand for Anti-Defamation League. It really stands for all day long. And I think <laughs> that both Lisa and Fernando would attest to that, that they really, uh, from morning to night, they really got to experience the majesty and the richness of this really incredible country. As Sylvia said, only 8 million people, but incredibly strong, 
and powerful and vibrant. Um, so with that, I want to just really kind of open it up to the two of them and introduce them both and then let you know that I'm going to tee up a couple of questions and then, of course, we will leave some time for Q&A. I'm sure many of you will have questions from both Lisa and Fernando. So to first introduce Lisa. Lisa is in her second term representing 24th District Hill in Illinois. Before this, she worked for then Lieutenant Governor Pat Quinn as his social director for policy. And before that, she served a 17 year career in the Cicero Public School District managing its multi million dollar educational grant office. Fernando Diaz, to my far left, is currently the managing editor of Voice Chicago, the largest circulation Spanish language daily newspaper in the U.S., and its website, Viva Loe. He is on the board of several non for profits, including the National Association of Hispanic Journalists and the Chicago Headline Club. So to start this off, I think it would be appropriate for us to just turn to both of you, Lisa, you can start first, and just talk about just opening reflections, um, some introductory remarks about the experience, what you took away from the country, and things that you think would be relevant to share with the group. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I want to first start by uh, also thanking the Latino uh, Family um, Policy Forum, I should say Latino Policy Forum, and also the ADL for putting this together and uh, giving me the opportunity to ch share such a phenomenal, phenomenal trip. Um, I think the first thing that came to mind, uh, not ever being in Israel before, and all the news that you hear and what you read in the papers, is that you have this idea that Israel is a very conflicting country, that once you, you come in, that you see possibly destruction and security is, is, um, is something to be of concern. And that is completely the opposite of what I um, encountered. Uh, it's a beautiful country. Uh, and the, 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 the people are so welcoming uh, to the point that I can truly understand and see the, the connection. Um, whether it be, um, I think mainly the religious aspect of it, uh, of the country, what it offers, that attracts, and I, I would say it's almost like a, a magnet that brings people to that certain point of this, this world. So for me, I, I, uh, I felt that it was, it, it, was, it was a country that gives a lot, uh, and uh, spiritually, it, it, it was it, it, truly phenomenal. Uh, well, for me, I'd, I'd also like to thank uh, both the Latino Policy Forum and ADL for making such a tremendous uh, trip possible. Um, these, these trips don't come by very often. Um, they're not available to everybody, and so uh, it's something that I definitely tried to take the most advantage of. Um, and I'd like to thank Sarah McComery for actually um, telling me one day, hey, uh, so would you like to go to Israel? Um, and I thought, I'm not buying a timeshare in Israel. Uh, now, uh, for me, I think, I think what, what, you know, I went, um, and so once I found out that, that we were going, I stopped reading everything um, on purpose uh, because I didn't want what was most immediate uh, to cloud, I guess, what had been my contextual background for Israel. Um, it was never really much of an issue um, for me, and, and you know, it was as foreign as the Silk Road and you know, Australia. Uh, things happen there. Um, there are political problems that should be pretty simple to resolve, and you know, and that was where I left it. Um, being raised Roman Catholic, going to Catholic school all the way through high school, I thought I understood because I didn't sleep through every uh, religion class I had. Um, but uh, in, in actually going there, I think it reinforced that it's not simple um, and it's not political. Um, there's there's much more there. Uh, there's a uh, incredibly rich and you know uh, conflicted uh, religious, cultural, geographic, and especially political situation um, that requires more interest, uh, that requires more study, that requires more investigation. Um, and I think I came back with a renewed sense of what I didn't know, um, and, and a need to constantly uh, follow um, what's been going on there. And so now, when I hear that there's a strike at Ben Gurion Airport, I'm like, hmm. I remember my experience at Ben Gurion Airport. Um, that's you know that's not the kind of place 
that a strike is a good place to be. Um, so, uh, so and I can talk for hours. I'll stop right there, um, and then I'll answer your questions. That's great. Um, by the way, these missions don't happen um, by accident. I would like to also publicly thank our local Harris Foundation here, who was gracious enough to support both Fernando and Representative Hernandez on their trip to Israel. And so I know some of my colleagues are out there, Darcy and others, so thank you so much for the Harris Foundation. We appreciate it. Um, and hopefully we'll continue to invest in what we think is a really interesting and important partnership. Um, in terms of issues on the place of Latinos in this country, and especially with groups and advocacy groups like Latino Policy Forum, the issue of immigration is obviously front and center. And at the ADL, we've been very vocal about calling for comprehensive immigration reform in this country. And one of the things that we made sure of when you both went on your mission to Israel that you would visit an Olpan. And for those of you who don't know what an Olpan is, that is essentially an absorption center, which was started right when Israel really started in 1948, which really brings in immigrants from all over the world and begins the process of teaching them Hebrew and indoctrinating them with the culture of Israel, teaching them job skills, and ultimately hopefully finding them a place and making themselves sufficient so they can go out and really assimilate and become Israeli citizens. It's it's an interesting, interesting place to observe. And I figured this would be interesting for you to kind of ruminate a little bit about your experience at the different old ponds that you went to in your week in Israel. Yeah, go ahead. So I, um, I'll start. Um, there was one that we did uh, attend. And um, it, uh, it was mainly young uh, men and women that we were able to meet and have discussions with. It gave me some, somewhat of a campus collegiate type of uh, atmosphere. Uh, the young uh, men and women were very, very comfortable, very, um, it, it, it seemed like home to them. Uh, what was interesting, it, um, many of the um, students came from different parts of the countries. Um, um, I believe it was a total of 25 countries or so that they come from. Um, and um, basically come to the, to the campus, we will call it campus, absorption center. Um, and they, um, it, it reminds me a little bit about what, what the welcoming center is doing here in Illinois. So bringing together uh, folks, newcomers, integrating them, preparing them um, with jobs and housing. But what was interesting is they would not my understanding is that they would not leave the, uh, the center until they had their job, that they had some housing, until uh, their language was, was well, um, they were well up to par with, with their language, that they were uh, ready to um, enter into the Israel society. So that really gave me a sense that maybe we're on the right track with the welcoming center. and. Um, that maybe we can learn from um, these absorption centers on how we can elaborate perhaps uh, what we're doing right now. Um, we're doing the same thing. The welcoming center is just that, uh, trying to integrate newcomers into society, um, bringing them um, uh, the types of services that could uh, begin, where they can begin their life here in, uh, in, in whether it's in Illinois or in any other state, but it's, it's a start. Uh, so um, I, I'm hoping that we can keep continuing uh, these conversations and, and look a little bit more into what these centers are doing and learn from them. Um, for, for us, it was, uh, we went to also, it seemed like a very collegiate, um, you know, it's like going to college orientation, except it's for a country where you're gonna be a citizen, you know? Um, and failure is not an option. And when you get out, you have a job. You don't have to look for a job. Um, that, was, that was very interesting. I think um, part of what, uh, I think in theory, the Ulpan as it, as it exists in Israel is uh, personally unbelievable from an actual practical point of view. Like you don't think that a government would be that invested and f fund something to that degree. Um, it doesn't seem like it's very loosey-goosey, like people are running around saying, hey, um, uh, I don't have my locker combination, or you know, I need this paperwork filed. It's a very organized, very well-structured process, um, which is completely uh, different from, I think, the overall way in which 
uh, immigrants are absorbed into this country. And the welcoming center is a step in the direction toward what an Ulpan does. Um, but I think that um, you know the, the Ulpan is such an all-encompassing experience um, that I don't know that we'll ever have something like that here because the conservative anti-immigrant base would never allow for it. Uh, would never allow for funding on that massive of a scale of what actually would be required here. I think also, um, you know, when we talk about immigration in Israel, um, you know, I found myself eating hummus at every meal. Um, there was not a drop. one too. Yeah, uh, not a drop of rain um, in Israel. Uh, very few clouds. Gorgeous people from all over the world. It's like Amsterdam with sun and no drugs. Um, and you know, and at the same time, I said, hmm, well, maybe, maybe I'd never thought about moving to Israel, but maybe I could come to Israel. And then I realized that Israel is a Jewish nation. And so to be an Israeli, you have to prove your Jewishness. And so that's where I thought, OK, well, we have, you know, so, so that obviously presents a challenge um, you know, for everyone to immigrate to Israel. Um, and I think that uh, you know, right or wrong, that's part of, you know, the, that's part of what makes the Ulpan possible. Um, is it's not just about citizenship. It's about building a nation. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about, you know, uh, uh, naturalizing a United States citizen, you know, you're becoming a citizen. There, I think it, it really is the word nation. Uh, I think that, that when you talk about Israel, it really is about a nation and not just a country. Um, and that's why I think it's also a little challenging to, to attempt to imitate what an Ulpan accomplishes. Um, because while we do very successfully at the welcoming centers, help people learn English, help people learn the kind of our governmental structure and get them acclimated, there's also a fair bit that doesn't involve being part of this American nation um, and more just being a, you know, a very functional and useful <coughs> citizen. Um, so, and I'm still fascinated by Israel and immigration and something that I'm still ignorant about and still learning. Um, and one of the many issues that I came away with saying, wow, this is really, this is really interesting because in another place, and then we'll probably talk about, about the Bialik school, um, you know, where there is illegal immigration in Israel. You know, it's just not on the scale, I would say, that we've got here. Yeah, interesting. Um, I had the fortune of meeting with both of you before you left on your trip. And I know that, um, and everyone who goes to Israel for the first time, and by the way, this is the first time for both Representative Hernandez and Fernando, um, that you have preconceived notions. It's just natural. Uh, many of it actually, and Fernando would recognize this as well, is, is through the media, and in terms of what we see and what we hear and all the rest. Give us a sense of some of your misconceptions before you went on the trip, and then what turned out to be a completely different reality once you set foot in the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. Yes, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I had cautioned Lonnie that I didn't have any misconceptions going to Israel, um, and uh, and I and I would and I would still I would still emphasize that what I had was a, just a boatload of ignorance, you know. And I think that we all do because we, I think in being in the media, I'll put the card right on the table. You know, we pass a story through, and, and it's true because we checked it and we verified it, and it's true. Uh, we had uh, some really good conversations with the AEL folks in, uh, in Israel who monitor um, media. I mean, and it's fascinating the entire operation that they have to monitor media. And, uh, you know, when I went, when I went so I'll, I'll start with my misconceptions in terms of just things that I was just really not aware of. I thought um, that uh, Israel was full of white people because, you know, most Jews are white. And it's an incredibly diverse, uh, ethnically diverse country. Um, you know, and so when I got there and everybody is talking in Spanish, I was like, no, what? <laughs> um, you know, so, so that was also, that was really interesting. But the fact that I think that, that we think we know what's going on and that we think that, you know, whichever way the ball is hit across the net today or yesterday or tomorrow is some new, you know, wrinkle of truth on, on the issues. Um, I thought it was simple. I thought it was just, hey, Freaking get over it, you know. Just agree to agree or disagree, and just come on. Let's move on. Let's stop fighting. Um, and then I was standing at the Western Wall, and you know, and the Dome of the Rock is on top. And it's all those years of religion class and all those experiences and all those stories just hit me straight in the face. 
there's no two-state solution for that, right? You can't just kind of put them next to each other and say, now we're really going to get along. Uh, and so for me, it was really bringing uh, elements of my religious heritage, of my cultural heritage, and of my education together and saying, here, idiot, you know, this is why it's so complicated. It's been staring you in the face your whole life, and you haven't even taken a moment to really understand the full extent of it. Um, and so uh, for me, my misconceptions were more uh, you know, observations and realizations on things. Um, you know, maybe not as the way they are, but as they present themselves. Um, and a heightened sensitivity toward, especially after the conversation with the uh, folks in uh, the ADL in Israel, on, hey, just because you pay for the wire service and just because they win Pulitzers and just because they're holding themselves up to the highest standard doesn't mean sometimes they make mistakes. And that they're not always passing the best story or the right story or who they talk to. Um, and so, you know, right or wrong, what it means now is that we cover those issues less because what we don't want to do is feed a stereotype or feed a perception. You know, we deal in perceptions. We, we think that we serve reality, but oftentimes we're just, you know, crafting a perception um, uh, for our readers, which we hold ourselves to the highest standard to do. But again, it's at the, it's at the, the mercy of our resources and how much we can actually invest in, in understanding or uncovering or checking on the truth. Um, and so it just made me a lot more sensitive toward what's coming out of there. I, I found out Israel has 3,000 journalists. And I was like, with so many damn journalists, why is it so confusing? It's because there's so many journalists. Um, so, you know, what we're very sensitive now toward is not being 3,001 from 17, you know, 100 miles away. Um, and really being able to try and bring some perspective or really try to have more of these kinds of conversations both with our readers, internally on our staff, um, so that we can try to understand it and share whatever we do or don't understand as whatever we do or don't understand as opposed to this happened. You know. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the, you know, the misconceptions on perhaps maybe, why just not separate state and religion? Can be, you know, is it, to me I thought it, it's just that easy. <laughs> it's not. Uh, when, when um, in speaking to many of those speakers from both, both sides and hearing them out, there's so much conviction, conviction and so much history that history, uh, or rather that religion is, is, is the essence, is the why. Um, so I, I have to be much more sensitive to the fact that um, I'm, I'm, I'm from a country who has managed to do that, separate. It makes it much more easier. Um, for Israel, that's, that's been the history. It's based on religion. How are two governments, and that's how it is right now, two governments going to succeed? But they are working it out. They are working it out. And both, both sides have their, their stories to say. So I guess um, I'm just much more um, in tune, more respectful of uh, not it's seeing things that, that it's just not that easy, that you cannot just um, separate the state. I, that was one question I asked at the end. Um, one, of the, uh, our, our, uh, one of the judges who had retired at the end of, of, the, um, of the trip, she was one of our last speakers. I think, it, you know, and I, I posed that question to her and I asked, you know, will Israel ever see that? Can it come to be? where that could come to terms where we can separate um, state from religion because really a lot can be solved uh, if that was to happen. And she came back with a very strong response, absolutely not. And that kind of said it all. Lisa, keep in mind for a second. You had mentioned to me before you left that some of your friends and colleagues had said things like, are you worried about your safety and security? And I'd like you to touch a little bit about the way you felt when 
and you were spending the week in Israel. So sure, Lonnie, and that was, when we got together, that was actually my first questions because that was posed to me, you know, well, aren't you, are, you know, this is not a good time for you to go. I mean, with all the conflict that's occurring right now, aren't you, you know, afraid? And so not ever being there and just hearing from others and reading and seeing, um, you know, what, 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 uh, what's going on, um, no, absolutely not. Um, I. I felt very secured. There, you know, I guess the first thought was probably there was going to be this military presence all over the, the place. No, on the contrary. Uh, the only time that I ever saw anything really is uh, when we had to, when we end up going to Bethlehem. And uh, of course, Bethlehem is a, um, is a, is a um, I'm, I'm, correct me if I'm, it's not a settlement. It's a Palestinian um, city. So naturally, there is guards, there's, there's, there's security. And that's basically the only time I really saw it. Um, so I, um, yeah, th those, those, I guess, are um, obvious misconceptions that one, one thinks of. Um, but I guess you have to visit to really understand. Um, there's, there's just this presence in Israel, I have to say, um, that once, um, once you arrive and see the country for yourself, um, it, it, it's just, for me, uh, I became very relaxed, uh, very welcomed, um, and I too have to admit um, there was a point can you ever move out here? But once, um, once I did hear you have to be of Jewish descent to become an Israel citizen, I mean, just the thought, because I tell you that that presence is there of um, connection that the, co the country does give. Just, just, so, just for a factual statement, there are 1.5 million non-Jews that do mm -hmm. live in Israel. Yep. So uh, the notion that you have to be Jewish is not necessarily Case, but of course, it is a Jewish country, and therefore, you are living in an area. You know, stores are closed on Shabbat and all the rest. But there are obviously non-Jews also that live in Israel. Um, I wanted to ask you, Fernando, a question about you mentioned media and Spanish language reporters in the Middle East. What do you think is the right balance, and do you feel like there should be more of an investment? I know you met with a few reporters mm -hmm. from Spanish language newspapers there. Uh, do you think there should be more of an investment in the Middle East, specifically Israel, other areas, to really better educate the Latino community throughout the world? That's a, we don't have enough time yeah. for that. Um, yes, and I'll answer that, but I definitely wanted to take two seconds to answer the security question if I could. Sure. Um, <clears throat> So I expected machine guns on every corner. Uh, and I wasn't worried, because I knew the ADL wouldn't let anything happen to Fernando. Um, but my girlfriend was very worried. Um, and, uh, and I have to say, uh, just like Brett Fernandez, that, you know, that you don't, you're not hit in the face with you know, people in, in, in military attire. On the contrary, when we went on our helicopter trip, the, uh, the security guards were wearing jeans, polos, huge assault rifle, and sunglasses. <laughs> and I was like, where's your beret and your, your flashlight and your backpack and all that? No, just a massive gun with a <laughs> sight on it. Um, and um, the other thing I would say is, and it, this hit me on the way out, and I have a, I have a, a, a very fun story about my uh, departure from Ben Gurion Airport, which is, I can tell off, offline. Um, but the three letters IDF, um, and I think it goes back to what I was touching on in, in terms of what the OPAN does in terms of nation building. Um, military service is an obligation in Israel. Um, and I think that yeah, that goes a long way toward being invested um, and to understanding the conflict on a very personal level because you've got to patrol. You've got to you know, be out there defending the country. Um, and when you realize that uh, the very attractive young man or young woman that you're talking to who's in college right now is trained to defend the country with their bare hands, you realize there's no need for assault rifles on every corner because there's a very secure perimeter. 
um, and that if anything were to happen within the country, that there are people who can do first aid. I mean, if, if, a, if a bus explodes, there are people who understand emergency medical procedures. Um, I mean, that, that's fascinating to me because basically, you know, who wouldn't want that kind of citizen walking around the street every single day? You know, whether there's a car crash or a, somebody choking on a popsicle, you know, whatever, you have people that are capable of addressing the needs of their countrymen um, in any instant. Um, so in, in, with respect to your media question, I'm not sure what the answer is, um, but I think that what it involves is, you know, we have, we have this issue with, you know, being OI, being an ethnic publication, being in Spanish, we've got to have a slant on the immigration debate. Well, I'm, I'm, we're working on a story right now about Republicans who are trying to change the perception of Republicans on immigration reform from within the Republican Party. I spoke with a gentleman yesterday from Minnesota who's white and married to a Honduran immigrant who is the leader of the Café con Leche Republicans, which, which, which started in October because he and nine other guys broke ranks with the Tequila Party and Somos Republicans, which had started in July, because those two other parties had been attacking indiscriminately Republicans on everything, as opposed to really addressing the issue of immigration reform. This guy introduced a paragraph into the state GOP platform in Minnesota at the caucuses to change how the Minnesota state GOP addresses or the official position on immigration reform. That's fascinating to me. Now, we can write all day about how poorly our immigration system is handled, how bad it is, and who the bad guys are. But if we're not writing those stories, then we're really not telling the deeper parts of it. And I think that what we end up finding in a lot of the coverage that comes out of Israel um, is not the under the surface stuff. It's all the surface crap. It's all the back and forth that you get on uh, Hardball with Chris Matthews and you know, uh, uh, CNN at night when everybody just starts screaming at each other and you really, you're just watching it and you're thinking, is this people's court? Because who has a point and what is it? And at the end of the day, how much more educated am I about this issue, having spent half an hour or an hour watching that? Um, I know that you know, as uh, media organizations continue to pull back and continue to invest less, um, it becomes more difficult to focus on those kind of stories that t take more time and could be more educational. Um, and I think that we as news consumers need to find different outlets and not expect that the New York Times and the Washington Post are going to have the last word or the word on what exactly is happening or happened yesterday. Thank you. This question is for Representative Fernandez. Um, as a member of our General Assembly here in Illinois, uh, and your other colleagues that went with you on the trip, all of them were elected officials as well, we thought it important for you to meet with members of the Knesset, which is the Israeli parliament, made up of 120 different people from all different parties, a different political system that we have here in the United States. And I know you met with several key leaders, and I just wanted to get your thoughts about some of the similarities, some of the differences vis-a-vis -vis the way that they legislate versus what we do here in Illinois and other parts of the country here. So they do have the, the three branches, which is the legislative, judiciary, and executive. Um, however, uh, 120 members, it's a unicameral um, uh, uh, how they lead, and um, the, um, it's several parties uh, within, and I, I'm not sure, but it's, it's a list of parties. I think the, the Kadima being the major one. Uh, am, I, am I saying that right? Yeah, Kadima is one of the major parties. And so we did get so, uh, to speak to someone from that party, and other, uh, the other was um, from the uh, public affairs uh, area. But what was interesting, I find, is that um, they, um, the executive and the judiciary are also members of the parliament, the legislative. Uh, so they work under, um, uh, they, they conduct their, their uh, legislative Hebrew. So they, they, they do, the language is all Hebrew. Um, uh, what are the others? Um, it's 120. What was interesting too, because we went down on the floor, is they speak. You know, so it's 
you know, down in, in Springfield, you do have to um, request to have a moment to speak, or if you're on debate, uh, you have to press your button. Not here. There, it's 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 pretty much across the aisle, shouting it, which we found that to be very interesting. Um, they, uh, the place was beautiful. Um, the committees. So the, the way that the breakdown, uh, if I remember correctly, was they have up to three readings. So the when they have a bill, it, it could be a government bill. It could be a committee bill, or it could be a member bill. Um, they, they are, um, if uh, the next step would be to, to the first reading, and then it's broken down. It's a little bit similar, but it's different. So um, the first reading goes into the second reading. There is some debate, uh, but the third reading is where it becomes law, uh, which. Um, that, that I find it fascinating because it's completely different. With us, of course, you see that when there's a bill that is passed, it goes to the governor, then the go um, once it's passed, the governor then signs it and becomes law. So um, in essence, yes, there is some similarities because of the branches being similar, but how it's conducted is very different. Um, what else did I find interesting? Um, well, we were, um, this is a little bit off, but the judiciary, we did, we were very fortunate to speak to one of the Supreme Judges, and Israel is run by the Declaration of Independence. They don't have a constitution, which was another interesting, because if you really think about it, um, if there is um, a case that has to do with a religious matter, how, how they do this, it's, um, is interesting. We just um, how they can work it out without a constitution. Obviously, they're doing well um, without that, but it's something to continue to study, you know, and and uh, see how they're um, um, they're able to conduct their government business uh, without the constitution. But those are just some of the areas that I did find very interesting. Uh, similarity, yes, but um, very different, obviously. Uh, you mentioned language, and when you went to the Knesset, you mentioned people were sometimes talking loudly about another <laughs> Hebrew. Um, but there are two official languages in Israel, Arabic and Hebrew. And I'm sure you know, both of you being bilingual were probably cognizant of the fact that there are a few languages spoken in that country. Um, any thoughts with respect to your observations of language in Israel and how you could maybe apply some of the things you saw there in terms of here as well? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, what I, I found, um, the encouragement, the welcoming of, of, of different languages, and actually to um, be studying um, uh, besides Hebrew, the different languages at, at the Alpan. Um, it was it was wonderful to see um, how you know the students that I did meet were from the South American countries, of beautiful Spanish, but new Hebrew as well, and their English was wonderful. So it gave the idea of there's a very a, a, a good sense of how um, language is encouraged, at least the variety of languages, and um, something that uh, I believe here in the states we need to keep continue working on and uh, pressing upon the value of what different language, diverse language, brings um, to our communities. Yeah, uh, for me the language issue uh, was fascinating because um, I live in I live in Pilsen, and depending on the street or the part of Pilsen that you live in, it can be bilingual or monolingual. Um, and being in a country where virtually everyone is bilingual um, is, is 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 an ideal. Uh, in, in I mean, in my line of business, obviously, uh, but in you know. It was really great that people had a diversity of experiences in, in an education system um, that impressed upon them the, the, the necessity to learn Hebrew, um, especially as uh, Rep. Hernandez was talking, how religion is so important and such a part of the fabric of the, of the country. Um, for me, uh, what, what I did find interesting was that Arabic is not a required second language. Um, and I thought that if you know that that could potentially be a more conducive means toward securing peace, addressing peace, 
Um, part of what I saw was that uh, a lot of the, uh, I wouldn't say a lot, but many of the folks that I met who were Israeli Jews didn't know Palestinian Arabs. They maybe had some uh, Israeli Arab friends, but they didn't really know each other. Um, and we didn't go to uh, Palestine, Palestinian territories outside of Bethlehem, but I can, uh, I'll assume, as ignorant as that is, that the same is the case on the, uh, on the Palestinian side. Um, and I think that too often, as is, uh, you know, pardon me, with politics the world over, is that oftentimes the actual understanding between people um, gets clouded or, or gets diverted because of the politics. And, you know, that I think part of the problem is that, you know, the children who are growing up, uh, Israeli Jews, are not meeting the children who are growing up on the Palestinian side. And just like when you're driving down Austin and you're in Austin and you look across the street and it's Oak Park, um, you know, you can see the change one street over. No border, no fence, no assault, well, maybe assault rifles, but, you know, not officially. Um, you know, that break, that difference in culture, that difference in what side of the street you live on is magnified so many times over there because that border is closed with rifles and with uh, military. And so I think, um, and again, I don't know enough about the education system to understand the underpinnings, but I imagine that part of it is, you know, that there's probably religious or cultural uh, uh, opposition to requiring Arabic as a language in Israel. It's an issue that is definitely talked about in yeah. the time. Mm -hmm. It's a good segue into the last part, then we'll go to Q&A. But uh, in the closing remarks, I wanted you both to just talk a little bit about an experience or a funny story that you had in Israel. And, and I know that on the serious side, you had mentioned um, the coexistence sports program, which is perfect segue into what you were just saying, Fernando, about Absolutely. Palestinians and Jews coming together. And I know that that was a program that really was very moving for you and had a profound impact on you. If you could just maybe tell us that in your closing remarks, that would be great. So we had the opportunity to um, Actually, we had this, the meeting of, uh, with the director who, um, who oversees the sports center. What he, um, his his um, mission is to try to bring sports um, as the medium of um, children, both Arab uh, and Jewish, to coexist, using that as the tool of, of bringing together team, team um, um, you know, teamwork, um, and being, you know, uh, competitive, but uh, we, we, he welcomed us to his home, which was wonderful because instead of a meeting place, um, he had us come to his home, very humble man, um, and then he um, took us to the center where the, the, the children were playing sports, showed some of the activities that they do to uh, bring together these children. So what you're seeing here is, um, two areas that are very conflicting, really, through the eyes of children coming together uh, and using sports as the way to do it. So I found that to be very, very impressive and, and um, innovative in a way how they're, they're trying to bring peace, perhaps. Um, the other area, obviously, uh, was, um, I'm a Roman Catholic myself, and take, um, my, my beliefs very seriously. So for me to be there on site, in person, on some of the most um, historical sites ever uh, was very, very spiritual and very impacting to me. Uh, there was one day, because obviously you would, uh, you know that uh, a lot of these historic sites, there's just people from all over the, the world coming in. Crowds are, are incredible. So we were recommended to, um, uh, it was the, uh, the Church of the Sepulchre, and we, it was recommended that if you really want to get to the site, so wh where I wanted to actually be able to at least touch, be there in person, to be able to touch the area, is where uh, Jesus was laid to rest. And I was told, if you come in the next day, which was a Sunday morning, if you come around five o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning, you'll be able to get there. There's, there's not gonna be any crops. Well, I wonder why. <laughs> so I, um, I actually, uh, my, myself and another uh, legislator um, actually got 
Um, we, we got up and we're there at five o'clock in the morning and um, the honest God truth, nobody was around. <laughs> so we were actually able to get in um, and we, uh, there was a mass that was actually conducted within the, um, the tomb site. Uh, so I, uh, I, you know, the fact that I was able to confess and I was able to take communion right there in, in a, it was a special moment for myself. So that's something I took back that certainly is not, uh, it's gonna, it, it's a once in a lifetime kind of thing. So um, I really thank you for that opportunity. It's, it's, it's very personal to me and very spiritual. Uh, Lana knows this is not a fair question um, because I can't pick one thing. There's five million things. Um, but um, I would say now is the is the is the the gentleman that you were mentioning the Bedouin, the director of uh, amateur sport for Israel, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or is this the program that it's Gazi? It's yes, the sports center of culture. Yes, so, so Gazi, Gazi, Gazi. So when I go back to Israel, I'm interviewing Gazi. Uh, mm -hmm. So Gazi is a Bedouin, um, and he's Arab. And he's mm -hmm. the head of amateur sport for Israel. So we had fascinating conversations about Arabs in professional sports in Israel, um, which is also another very taboo subject. You know, how is Israel going to send an Arab to the Olympics, um, even if they're Israeli, um, because of the because of the cultural um, ramifications? Um, I walked away with eight thousand story ideas that. Um, uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre for me was also uh, hugely impactful. I'm a bad, bad, bad Catholic. Um, <laughs> haven't been to Mass in a long time, haven't confessed, and I can't remember, maybe confirmation. Um, but, uh, but I do have a... He's got a I say now. sorry all the time. Um, but, um, but, but the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was fascinating. Um, uh, you know, not just for the religious context, uh, because we went when we were in Bethlehem and we went to the Church of the Nativity. Yeah, um, that's uh, You know, where where supposedly Christ was born. Um, I felt I felt a connection with my aunt, who is faithful, 85 years old, has never missed a Sunday at Mass, and I said, "Damn it, I shouldn't be here. She should be here, because this would mean so much to her." And so I had a connection with my aunt via this place um, that otherwise I wouldn't have really, really appreciated. Did you but really it, say damn it? I didn't, no. <laughs> but, we cut, but we cut line, which, which, which if you go to Israel, never, ever, ever underestimate a good guide. Our guide, uh, Ariel Skolar, Skolar um, was just so amazing. He's a Uruguayo who uh, uh, emigrated with his family, who, who, did, uh, who performed Aliyah. Um, and uh, he spoke excellent Spanish because he's Uruguayan, but he would go between Spanish, English, and Hebrew in a uh, heartbeat um, and knew so much about the history that it really was more than just, and here we are, it was, and here we are, and in 800 AD this happened, and three years ago this happened. And, um, but for me, what really sealed uh, it outside of standing outside of the Western Wall and just kind of um, appreciating the proximity just how small it all is, um, was learning through Scholar and do, doing my research at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is controlled by Christian sects who can't get along with each other. Yeah, isn't that interesting? And so here we are, holiest place on planet Earth, people who love Jesus and love God and can't get along over the very patch of dirt that they all can agree he was actually crucified and buried on. And so we're in the church looking at all this, watching one sect rush the other sect out of the place because it's their time to pray. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> and then we go down to the tomb. And yeah, the line is incredibly long. Um, and uh, walking out and hearing prayers. Arabic prayers because it was four or five o'clock. And so here I am in the old city at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre listening as they're blaring Arabic prayers. Um, I, you can't make that up. I mean, it was just really, uh, you have to be there to do that. And then 
walking out, um, because as I've also uh, corrected Lonnie multiple times, it's not all day long, it's all day and night long. Um, journalists like to drink. The ADL does not give time to drink, because you've got to be up in the morning. And dinner ends at 11.30. Um, so, but you can drink at dinner. You can drink at dinner, yes. Um, so, so we walk out, and Ariel, our, our guide, and Sonia Spar, an ADL colleague from uh, New York, said, you guys have 15 minutes to buy mementos. 15 yeah. minutes, and it's kind of like, what? <laughs> you know how many relatives I have? It's impossible. <laughs> Everybody. And so we're walking around, and, and so I'm kind of looking around, looking around, and I stumble into a shop, which is the first shop on the right when you walk outside of the little plaza where the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre entrance is. And I start talking to the man, and I say, uh, do you sell Arabic newspapers? I collect newspapers wherever I go. And he's like, why? Why do you want Arabic newspapers? I'm like, because I'm a journalist and I want to see the design and I want to understand what stories they play and all this stuff. And he goes, which side are you on? And I was like, sir, I have no side. I just, do you, I'm on a time schedule. Do you have, and he goes, come on into my store. So we start talking and sure enough, he's got three different papers um, from a couple of weeks ago. We start talking, we start talking, we start talking. It turns out, that he lived in Berlin <laughs> for 20 years. And Representative Fernandez should be representing him. That's right. And I said, Berlin. And he goes, yeah, I lived in Berlin for 20 years. I've got a brother out there, blah, blah, blah. And so Ariel had told me what to me was the most fascinating piece of the trip, which is that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is in the old city. Old city is in Israel. It's run by a Christian sex who can't get along. And who has the key to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? A Muslim. And the Muslim that has the key is this guy's buddy. From Berwyn. So no, he's not from Berwyn. Yeah. So so I, I, I checked the story out with, with, with the gentleman and he was like, Yeah, he's our friend. His family has had the key for hundreds of years. Um, and so just to kind of, you know, try to fit that into my tiny brain, um, I thought these are the kinds of stories that are in Israel that aren't getting out because those are the stories that get crowded out by there was a bomb or there was another rocket or Ahmadinejad said X or we've got all these issues. So um, there's a ton of stories and a ton of experiences there um, that I think you know, when folks go there, as we've said and repeated, and I think you can get the message, it's you have to go there to actually appreciate it. Um, but when there is media there, I think, you know, one of the criticisms that I have for media is that it's way too pack driven You know, everybody's got to be on what Gingrich just said, um, as opposed to really looking at what's beneath the surface. And I think, you know, for me, what, what I really appreciated about the trip was I got an opportunity to see and to talk with people that gave me a lot of stories that I otherwise wouldn't find and haven't found in the media, and now it's my job, my responsibility, to make sure that now I know i got to do something about it. Well said. Well said. Thank you both. Uh, did you have a few minutes for questions? Uh, but terrific. Both of you did a wonderful job, and I'm sure there are people that would love to ask a question. Michael. Um, do you have a microphone, David? Or? Just I'll, repeat, I'll try to repeat the question. And I'll talk loudly. There you go. <laughs> First of all, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I think the term wasn't in use when Israel was created, national liberation movement, mm -hmm. but Israel is certainly an example of one of the most successful of all history. Mm -hmm. What can be learned from your experiences in Israel with regard to Hispanic issues here in the United States? What did you take home with you that you thought you could plug in to the agenda which is of concern to us here in this community? Mm -hmm. uh, can I take a step? Yeah. So, so um, one of the things that's most challenging and most frustrating in being editor of a major daily newspaper is when uh, people call to complain about the horoscope or the crossword and not about your coverage. And I think that what I learned in, uh, what I learned about Israeli culture is that everyone has an opinion. And most people have two. Uh, and very few people argue or 
uh, will attempt to convince you of their opinion uh, because it's just something they came up with. In most cases, they're very well read, they're very well documented, and they know their stuff. And I think that you know, you know, my challenge as an editor is to slap that sleeping giant every single day and to engage the Latino reader um, with with almost whatever tool I have in my you know, with barring breaking ethics and um, and lying, um, is to really say, guys, wake up, move, vote, like. Be involved in the debate, and I think that you know, you know, witnessing how engaged and how lively political conversation is, you know, you don't get that hardcore about something unless it's a soccer game or you know, or sports. And I feel like we don't have enough of that discourse here, um, and we have myriad challenges, I feel, in the Latino community in terms of political empowerment. Um, you know, we have our own bilingual issues. Um, you know, uh, we have uh, folks um, who, you know, who are elected officials representing folks in this very state, not at the state level, um, who, who will post on the Huffington Post in English, but won't send me it in Spanish. And, and, and I'm that person's actual uh, they're my representative. So take my editor title away, take my newspaper job away. They represent me. If my, if my father, or my mother, or my aunt can't understand what they're posting on the Huffington Post, but they voted for that person, we have a problem. Um, I posted, we, we published an editorial cartoon on the cover of our newspaper on Friday, specifically because I wanted to see what the reaction would be. I wanted people to call the newspaper and say, you need to fire Fernando Diaz. That's reckless, ignorant, uh, needlessly controversial, and he needs to go. And I got one phone call. Yes, it was a piñata. I got one phone call from somebody asking me what it meant. So I engaged that person. You know, and to me, I said, you know, Latinos, immigration debate has become the piñata of the Republican national debate. Their response was, I'm offended because the, 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 we, we, we depicted a, 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 a Mexican immigrant um, as the piñata because he wasn't wearing a suit. Hit me hard, hit me real hard, challenge me, make me serve you better. And I think that you know, in Israel, you've got so many newspapers so many big, fat, broadsheet newspapers. I was in Ben Gurion, and I was reading press from all over the world. I was going to the corner store, and I was finding press from all over the world. I'd turn on public access television in my hotel room, and I was fascinated. They have Spanish language programming on television in Israel. And I'm sitting there watching shows from all over Latin America. And so it's a very informed uh, populace. And I feel like we need that. We need more and more and more of that here so that people are more uh, armed and ready to argue uh, on their behalf or on our behalf, but to have more spirited debate on these very issues like immigration. Another question? Or at least you want to take it? Well, I was just going to, um, just a little perspective. Um, what I took away is a country who is um, 60 plus uh, years old and who is able to progress and able to, um, um, with, in terms of the immigration um, reforms that they are trying to pass, is, is a, a, an example to maybe what we need to look at. Um, I know that as a Latino legislator, it's been tough to try to engage our community but the, the, the more I think legislators are informed, for me, it, it helped me, I learned from this trip, to pinpoint, to, to um, put more uh, emphasis on some of my work on, on maybe even different areas. Um, so I think that these kinds of exposures that are given to 
legislators, in my case, what I bring back is that I, um, I'm not working hard enough, I gotta get on the ball. Mm -hmm. if, I'm out, if I'm not already working, well, it's not enough. Um, I have a question going back to one of the earlier um, responses that you gave. In regards to the integration of newcomers into society in Israel at the Old Town Center, I heard a lot about you know how this country isn't really there, but did you observe anything that you think, uh, the aha moment of, wow, we could be doing that here with the funds and resources we have available or with the organizations? And with uh, Hannibal Park Chamber, we have a large Latino community, mm -hmm. and I think that throughout Illinois, we have a lot of Latino communities similar to this that um, have individuals trying to become integrated, but you know resources may not be like where they need to be. So, is there anything that stood out in your eyes um, as wow, we can do this today? Just did, did everyone hear that question? question? <coughs> no. no. Um, she asked the question of when they went to the old pond uh, and they. Any takeaways from the old pond that they can apply back here locally to the welcome centers that both Fernando and Representative Fernandez mentioned in their comments? So that's the question. It's a, you know, I have to say it was it was a dif different dynamic on how they conduct their their centers. What we are beginning here, at least with the welcoming center in Illinois. Uh, the integration of bringing services to those who are newcomers. Very um, uh, kind of, um, I, I don't want to say basic, but just these uh, basic necessities. We're starting there. This is much more, the Alpine is much more um, intensive. And it's intense. It's, it's, um, it's kind of like the, this is what we would love to get to if we can get there. So I, um, you know, the fact that they have a place to go and be nourished, you know, there's, there's, there's a, uh, I want to say nourished, they're nourished in many ways, whether it's education, housing, but it's the language. It's literally in um, um, exposing to the Israel society what, what, what uh, the necessities, the tools that they need to really blend in, integrate. Um, I don't know. So I, they're intense. So I, I, uh, I look at it as just the example to keep working on it. Let's see where we go. Uh, I know there's a lot to be done with the Latino community, with immigration. As Jewish organizations in the Chicago area, what do you think we can do to help? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You want to go first? Um, Jewish organizations, how can you help? I think um, your existence already is helping, um, but um, I think partnering up probably with some of the other organizations, a good example would be like the Latino uh, Policy Forum, who can um, be, it, 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 would, it would help um, I think partnering up to see what the, to find what the common ground and learn from each other on what are the different um, you know different programming or services that you have in place, what your missions are. That if 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 you if you come together, this is where again um, I think that you're just helping one another. That's just out of the blue. For me, I would say be visible. Um, be visible on a personal level. Be visible on an organizational level. Write me a letter, and I'll publish it. Um, you know, have an opinion. Get that opinion out there. Um, I think I think that's what ultimately will 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 create more and more uh, discussion. Um, you know, there are going to be people who agree and disagree on on the Dream Act or on a cover or on a story choice. Um, you know. Um, but, but I think we all need to, it's not just Jewish groups, it's all of us need to be more visible in the debate. Um, you know, uh, because we could start, you know, detailing the laundry list and, and I think that, you know, as a Jewish organization, what you feel most comfortable doing, um, whether it's in education, whether it's in outreach, whether it's in support services, whether it's in uh, uh, legal um, services, 
any any number of areas could be of tremendous benefit. I don't think there's a silver bullet that, that Jewish groups are going to be able to resolve a lot of the issues that, let, that the Latino community has. But being part of the Latino community, I think, is already tremendous. And being visible is a huge step um, in the direction to finding out what those needs might be. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists again. You were terrific. comments of our partnership, I think this is a uh, perfect indicator of how when two groups come together, we can put together a terrific program. And I really kind of put it back to you, the audience, coming from both communities, to come to us, come to me, come to David, come to Sylvia, and say, here's what we're thinking about. Come up with some ideas about how we can come together as a community on an initiative, on a program. Um, it really should generate from the bottom up and, and kind of work its way through the different organizations, but that's how things get done. So. That is kind of my charge to the group today. Stay connected to both of our organizations. Um, and uh, that's it for today. Again, thank you all to the Spy Park and Shop for hosting me.